Oh. You good? It's why it's the Yes. OK, well, thank you for the very nice introduction. So I'm going to talk about the four color theorem. Uh, and as was mentioned, I sort of still part work at INRIA because we have this joint uh, research center uh, between Microsoft and INRIA. And they kindly decided to base their logo on the four color theorem. Um, so I think I'm a nice fixture, I guess. So uh, on with the four color theorem. So uh, I'll start with, the, uh, with an old tale because it's always seems to be a nice way of starting this talk. So this problem goes back actually to Cambridge. So uh, it's nice. I also finished in Cambridge. Uh, and it goes back to 1852 when the student in cartography, uh, who obviously had too much spare time, uh, decided to play around with uh, color pencils and color a map of the counties of England, figured out he only needed four colors, and asked uh, his uh, math tutor, so I figured out, well, four colors are enough, and so he asked his ma math tutor, who was the uh, father of modern logic, Augustus de Morgan, whether this was always true. And uh, curiously enough, the all-knowing professor did not know. Um, couldn't find the answer, but I thought it was a really neat puzzle, so he kept it under the rug for about 25 years to uh, basically pester every uh, visitor he could, uh, he could get. And uh, it, you basically had to wait to, until Augustus de Morgan's uh, retirement in 1878 for the problem to be published at the Royal Society. And miracle of competitive research, one year later, someone came up with a solution. And it was a really nice idea. So he wrote down his proof, and he said, look, look, uh, we know uh, that the average number of sides in a uh, map is six, or slightly less than six, really. Uh, we have this famous theorem by Euler that says a map is basically a football. So you have to have a pentagon somewhere. And so if we can reduce, the, solve the problem for a pentagon, then we've solved the entire problem because we're sure there's a pentagon somewhere. And so the, we have to look at this one configuration. There are, uh, if you just compute out, you see that there are basically three ways of coloring around it. Uh, and uh, check that uh, you can uh, reduce the problem of coloring to a problem of coloring a smaller map for each of these three cases, and you're done. And uh, the Royal Society was very pleased. Uh, Kempe was knighted. Uh, and all went well. There was even a second proof published. Um, all went well until 11 years later, some uh, poor, uh, poor sport came up and uh, pointed out that there was an error in the calculation and that the proof did not go through. Uh, as it turned out, the proof could not be fixed. And uh, so the problem lay in limbo for uh, the better part of a century. Uh, what happened was that people worked on it, and basically every mathematician at some time in his career worked or tried to try his hand as, at this. Some uh, rather famous mathematicians like Lebesgue spent a fair amount of time on it. Uh, and there was sort of very incremental progress, saying, well, okay, we know the average number of sizes is less than six, so perhaps it's, we're being a bit too greedy at looking at just the Pentagon. Let's look at bigger submaps. We'll have so we'll look at little m submaps, and we'll look at little n configurations, so parts of these submaps which we think might. Uh, uh, might work out. And then we'll look at colorings of these things. And the problem is the number of colorings uh, increases very rapidly with the size of the submap. So the big N here is actually very big. So big, in fact, that uh, you can't really solve this on pencil and paper. And so you had to wait for the advent of the modern computer to actually get a solution with a lot of ideas and a lot of hard work. Um, so the actual real proof involved looking at 10,000 submaps 
in, in text, mind you, they had about a thousand pages of little diagrams figuring out all the possible cases, uh, from which you extract about 1,500 configurations. And so here's the real clincher. You have to look at about a billion colorings to uh, figure out that these, uh, that these calculations work. And so, of course, you're not going to do them by hand, because by hand, uh, for three colorings, you get it wrong for 11 years before someone spots the error. And so you need a computer to do this, uh, which at the time had to be programmed in an assembly language. And even so, it took about two months of mainframe. Now, uh, this proof got mixed reception from uh, the academic community. So as it turned out, the specialists were rather pleased with it. That's what finally the, the problem had been laid to rest. Uh, and so Ap uh, Appel and Haken got credit for it, uh, for their work. But you have the people that doubted that you could re ser seriously run a thousand pages of little diagrams and not get one of them wrong in some uh, corner case. And indeed, I think a few years later, there were errors found there. And then there were other people that said, well, nobody has uh, a mainframe around, or few people have mainframes around, and uh, two months of mainframe costs uh, quite a bit of money. So this is a bit like an irre uh, irreproducible experiment. Uh, and uh, how are we going to trust computers to prove anything anyway? Uh, and I think it also turned out to be bugs in the assembly code as well. Um, so things stood in this kind of sorry state for about 20 years. And then uh, in 1995, there was a crack team of combinatorists that decided to uh, kind of clean things up a bit. And so they looked at the problem again. Uh, figured out that you could actually solve the problem looking at only 633 configurations and use the computer to handle the 10,000 submaps so that now the proof text had the manageable 35 page size. And of course, the C programs are a bit more readable than the IBM 370 assembly. And a uh, miracle of technique. Uh, you don't, do not, did not need a mainframe to solve the problem. You needed about three hours on a PC. And of course, every mathematician has a, had a PC by that time, because that was how he wrote his papers. Uh, so basically, everyone was happy. Uh, everyone but computer scientists like me and my IFIP colleagues who uh, very well understand that, uh, OK, you've written a proof, you've written a program, uh, but the connection between the program and the proof is pretty flimsy. So there's no doubt that the computer runs the program properly. And if you have any doubts, it's pretty easy to find another computer and another compiler to run the same program. Uh, but whether the program actually does what is needed to, to carry off of the proof, that's another question. And it's a question for uh, which computer scientists uh, have been, uh, like me, have been working on for uh, you know the past uh, uh, well, the past 20 years before that, uh, uh, 1995, um, thereabouts. And so we've developed a whole range of techniques for showing that programs actually do what we intend them to do. Uh, and so I figured out, well, let's try this. Let's try to actually write programs uh, that uh, write some specification that says, yeah, these programs do what's needed to carry out the proof um, and prove them correct. And so uh, you can't write them in C because C is a language for system as engineers, but not for mathematicians. So you have to use a description of algorithms that actually has some mathematical meat in it. So we use a system called COC. And so the system lets us write all the programs and uh, write the proofs of the program and then check them. So you can, the same system runs the program and checks their proofs. Um, and I guess I could have stopped there. And I got about there uh, after the sort of first uh, uh, six months of looking at the problem. But I figured that, well, the specification of the program is actually pretty complicated. Uh, and pretty far related from the rather simple statement of the four-color theorem. And uh, the system that does program proofs, it actually ha can handle all of mathematics. 
So I uh, tried boldly to go uh, the full Monty and uh, actually write the entire proof as a formal cock proof and have it checked by cock. And at this point, something very nice happens, which is that now to uh, trust that, uh, so there's no more gap between the program and, and the text. And furthermore, you don't even need the uh, Royal Society to tell you uh, that your proof is correct when it isn't. Uh, you, can, you actually have physical evidence of the proof which you can, uh, on which you can run multiple checks. So now anyone, uh, you don't need to be a specialist uh, to, uh, in these computer systems to trust that the proof is correct. Uh, all you need is to be able to check that uh, the uh, statement proof is the one you expect to correspond to the four-color theorem. And it takes about uh, an hour and a half, or it took an hour and a half when I did this in 2004, so it's probably, I think it's 30 minutes now. So. Uh, so that was actually quite a bit of progress, even though the four-color theorem is not deep mathematics, it's more of a puzzle than uh, anything else. Um, and it's a progress both in computer science and in mathematics, and I guess this is going a bit over the uh, nice introduction uh, I got, uh, but basically in, for computer science what this shows is that you can actually build programs that are as reliable, if not more, than mathematical proofs. Uh, and you can uh, actually ha use computer uh, calculations as part of a hardcore uh, mathematical proof, and we'll see an example of that. And it was also showed that uh, there's actually something to be gotten from even from the mathematical side of this kind of activity, because uh, as I use the computer system to build a formal proof, I also use it as a kind of logic calculator to analyze the logical structure of the proof and figure out structure that had been sort of swept under the, uh, the carpet uh, by the uh, combinatorists, uh, eminent combinatorists that had worked on the problem. They saw, saw, oh, well, these are uninteresting details, but actually there was interesting structure in the details. And uh, I'll also go uh, deeper on this during the, uh, the talk. So uh, I basically have two parts. One, which is uh, the uh, second part of, uh, of that uh, progress uh, slide, so the, of the, uh, the math of the problem, so stating the problem and the parts where uh, there was kind of new math that came out of the uh, machine. And a second part uh, about, well, how the engineering of it, how to go, uh, how to actually go about and build such complicated proofs. So first, the math. Okay, so let's start with the, with the theorem. So here's the statement of the four-color theorem. Every simple planar map can be colored with only four colors. Uh, so it's a statement that's uh, simple enough that basically school children can understand it and pretty much figure out what it means. It's actually uh, mathematically precise. So you can sort of drill down, uh, e uh, if you uh, replace each of the words there by something mathematic, you actually get a fully formal and correct statement of the theorem. And you sort of go about it in the obvious way, like a map, well, that's just a partial partition, so disjoint subsets of the plane. Uh, simple means open and connected, so basic uh, topological notions. Uh, coloring basically means finding a covering map. So you have a map with loss of country and you're superposing on it a map of empires and you just have four empires and it has to be a good map. And a good map for an empire is that uh, adjacent countries have to belong to different empires because empires are uh, efficient. So if they have two neighboring countries that share a border, uh, they want, just want to uh, merge them together so they can uh, make savings in, in administrative costs. Um, and adjacent just means having a common border point that is not a corner, and a corner oops, is uh, just a point that touches more than two regions. And that is enough to uh, completely describe the problem mathematically. Uh, you can actually get this wrong and get wrong definitions, but this is the right one. 
Uh, and uh, the nice thing about this is that the formal uh, definition, the one that goes into the computer, is pretty much a uh, slight expansion of the previous slide. So it still fits on one slide. And you still get the four color theorem down there, uh, which, uh, yeah, looks pretty much, uh, reads pretty much as the uh, original statement. So that's for the uh, connecting what's been done in the computer and comp uh, connect, uh, with the, our intuition of what's going on. Now, how does the proof work? Well, uh, well, the only way uh, combinatorial proofs uh, work, by induction. So how do you color a map by induction? Well, you figure out one place that's easy to color. Uh, so that's called the configuration, and the part around the configuration is the configuration context. Um, and then you do not start by, color, uh, by the easy part of the job. So you don't start by coloring the parts that's easy. What you start doing is doing the hard part. So to do the hard part, you mangle the map inside the configuration, uh, typically by erasing a border. So you just merge two countries together. Then, uh, then your map is smaller. So now you can invoke the miracle of induction and say, oh, well, if it's smaller, then somehow uh, it's a simpler problem, so I must be able to solve it. So I have some coloring. And uh, now, obviously, this coloring is not, won't give me a good coloring of the map because I have just fused two countries. Uh, so I have to fix it. And so uh, to fix it, I'll erase the part that's bad, like the part that's inside the configuration. And, and now I have to recolor the configuration to uh, match the context. And uh, I can try, but perhaps I won't be able to. In this case, I wouldn't be able to. So I, have to, I may have to fix the coloring of the context by uh, basically exchanging two colors in part of the map. So here, if I exchange the blue and the green and the uh, yellow uh, in this segment, uh, then uh, I've fixed the coloring and, uh, and I've got a good coloring of the map. And if my configuration is so easy to color that I can always do this, uh, then it's, called, it's said to be reducible. Uh, because uh, then I'm sure that this fixing step will always work. So if I can find a reducible configuration all the time, then uh, I'm sure that I can color the map. So that's the whole proof, really. Just find a set of configuration that's unavoidable, so you're guaranteed to always find uh, one of these configuration, and that's reducible, so each configuration in the set has uh, this reducibility property that you can always uh, fix it up to uh, match the surroundings. <coughs> and, and this is the part that's combinatorial. So the first part is the part where you look at 10,000 cases, and the second part is the part where you look at a billion cases. Of course, there's a hidden subtext, which is that you also have to do the math, right? This is the uh, part that requires you to do lots of computation. You also have to do the math correctly. And once you have a, a good computer, the what's hard is not doing the computation, it's doing the math. So I'm going to talk a little more about the, um, the, math, uh, the math, because uh, the big problem we have is that we have this combinatorial problem, and this problem is about maps. And so uh, how do you describe maps? Now, if you open any of the Art, uh, first articles about this problem, they will say, oh, well, a map, uh, let's see, we have this picture where we have uh, lines and lines meets, meet at uh, uh, nodes. Oh, edges, nodes, that's a graph, right? Well, wrong idea. Wrong idea because in, uh, it's very hard to tell whether a graph is planar unless you start doing topology and topo doing topology and combinatorics together is a, uh, is a bad, uh, is trying to do thing, two, thing, two very different things at once. Just doesn't work very well. Uh, there's an easy way out of this, which is to be a bit finer. Rather than putting one big gray blog where edges meet, you just put one little black dot at the corner of each uh, region. And now you can connect all the dots around a region, and that allows you to move around a region. Uh, you can connect all the dots around uh, a node, and that allows you to move around a node. 
And if you're uh, clever enough, you'll notice that uh, you can complete the diagonals of these uh, rectangles to give you little triangles, and that gives you a, uh, another uh, permutation that basically goes across edges. So you have one, uh, the green arrows that go around faces, the red arrows that go around nodes, and the uh, blue arrows that cross edges. And they basically always satisfy these, uh, build these little three-colored triangles. So that data structure is called a hypermap. And it has the very nice property of being completely symmetrical. And the planarity property is completely symmetrical in these, uh, in these three uh, kinds of arrows. And so that's the tool uh, that the actual formal proof uses, because it can't resort to hand-waving. Uh, while the combinatorists, when they write articles in learned journals, uh, do not cringe on hand-waving. So they have this main theorem, which is the uh, theorem that basically says how you can connect a configuration to the surrounding context. Uh, and I'm not going to go through, uh, through the statement, but I will point out uh, the proof of, the, uh, of this main theorem, which is, uh, well, it's a, bit, uh, it's a bit of a bother to show. No one ever bothered, and so we won't bother either. Um, which apparently sits well if you're uh, writing a paper because you're explaining that you're saving trees, but doesn't work very well if you have a uh, system that actually checks that you've done the proof completely. And as it turns out, the proof uh, is long and complicated because it, uh, it's based on this improper uh, representation of, uh, of maps. If you actually use hypermaps, then that mysterious phi function takes about four lines to describe and writing down completely in every detail the proof uh, of uh, this takes about 20 lines. So, how do we go from uh, the original statement in uh, topology to this little diagrams with, uh, with four arrows? Well, it's basically a process of discretization. So, let's start with a normal map with little regions. And so, what we'll do is we'll pick one point uh, reference point in each region. We'll pick one reference point at each border crossing. And so each border crossing has to have some little area around it where there are only two regions. So uh, we can pick one reference point in each, uh, for each of these. And now we've got points inside each region, and each region is supposed to be connected. So we can approximate the region by some kind of little uh, square uh, polynomial that connects all the, uh, all the points. And uh, we can uh, basically, inside each rectangle, we only get two polyminoes, so we can find some way of extending them so that they actually touch each other. And so since all, all of this is, all of map is described entirely by squares, we can put it on a square grid. And now uh, to get something that's uh, not any harder to, uh, to color than the original map, we only need to erase the grid inside the, uh, uh, the, uh, the little uh, polyamino shapes. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that uh, we had some topological notion of why the uh, original map was planar, right? It was planar because it was in R times R. Uh, and now we have a map, uh, a discrete map, so one we can directly translate into this common authorial structure. And how do we know that this map is planar? Well, our criterion was this Euler formula. Well, if we look at the full grid, it's pretty obvious that the Euler formula is, uh, is satisfied because we just need to count things. And so uh, while the original proof of the theorem will uh, would say something like, oh, well, we wave our hands to explain how we utilize the map, and then we invoke repeatedly the Jordan curve theorem, which is a rather difficult theorem of topology. Uh, here, we just use a trivial uh, counting lemma to figure out, uh, to uh, transfer the fact that we have a planar map. 
So how does, does that solve our uh, problem of connecting a region with a context? Well, uh, if we now look at this uh, hypermap model, uh, we now have a nice way of cutting out a configuration uh, from a context. So we have a little disk, which is our configuration, and a context of the rest of the map around. And so we want to express how we can cut out a disk and how we can glue things back together. So if we look a little closer at what happens here, uh, and we uh, put in our little dots at the corners and putting the little red and the little green arrows, uh, well, we can pretty much describe the disk by uh, this border that goes around and that sort of alternates red and green arrows. And now if we want to make this uh, an independent uh, hypermap, when then we just need to connect the, uh, close off the uh, green parts which are open and then uh, add uh, blue arrows to complete the, uh, uh, the outer rim. So what this tells us is that a uh, disk is uh, a hypermap that is surrounded by a blue border. And if you do the same operation on the outside of the map, you figure out that you get something that has a red border. And the uh, contour cycle is the part that describes how they, these two are cut out. And to glue them together, well, we just bring them together and uh, just add one green arrow to link up the, uh, the green path. So uh, that's cut and paste just, uh, just by uh, superposing figures. Um, so what's going to make, uh, so that tells us how to glue things and now, uh, now we need to have uh, to be able to still be able to identify the inside of the disk. So how do we figure what's inside and from what's out? Well, if we look at this contour, it basically alternates between re these red and these green cycles. So if we look more closely at the contour, we see that uh, the thing that can't happen in our map is to have part of that we don't want to ha happen, have happen is part of the contour that sort of comes out from the inside and that uh, enters back uh, from the outside. And the reason this can't happen is that uh, on the inside, we're, connect well, we're connecting red cycles and on the outside, we're connecting green cycles. So our map is planar when you don't have the situation where you have a cycle which has part green and part red. And if you flip this around and look, uh, uh, so, the, uh, so of course if there's one uh, red arrow here, or the green arrow over here, the other arrow that connects to the same point has to be red and conversely. So if you flip that around, what this says is that you can't have a contour that has these N-shaped short red shortcuts. And that is a purely combinatorial characterization of the Jordan property. And it completely replaces the uh, difficult topological theorem. Okay, so that's for the math. Now, how, uh, how do we fit all this math in the computer? So uh, it, the answer to that is uh, remarkably simple. Uh, and it rests on a remark by Frank uh, that's attributed to French mathematician Henri Poincaré uh, about uh, the interesting ways of proving that two, two and two make four. Of course, you might say that's because I've told you so and I hit your fingers with a ruler if you, you didn't agree. Uh, but the, if you want to actually uh, be a little more specific about it, uh, we should define what two is. So let's define it in the simplest possible way by saying that uh, it's two by virtue of a having added one twice uh, to zero, and four is four by virtue of having added ones four times. And so if we, uh, now that we've defined what two and four are, uh, we can set about proving that two and two make four, and if we do this in the sort of traditional uh, early 20th century uh, logician way, which was what uh, Poincaré was revolting against, 
um, will basically do lots of algebra and say, okay, we have used neutral right associativity, we replace um, twice, and ultimately we get there after five steps. And depending on your computer systems, these five steps might turn into 20 or 40. Uh, but there's some work to be done. And if there's that much work to show something that simple, uh, there's hardly any chance of proving that a billion colorings are correct. So what's the solution? Well, uh, uh, Poincaré's remark was that uh, two and two make four. Uh, to check that two and two are four, we just need to calculate. There's no need to uh, do this complicated reasoning. Reasoning has no place in here. And the modern take on this, the computer scientists take on this is that if we define what two and four are, sort of numbers, we can also define what plus means. Because uh, unlike uh, early 20th century mathematicians, computer scientists have no qualms about talking about algorithms. Uh, and so they'll say, oh yeah, plus is a recursive program, which is rather easy to define. And so uh, if I've written 2 plus 2 equals 4, uh, then what I've really written is 4 equals 4 with just a funny way of writing 4 on the left-hand side. And so to check them 2 and 2 make 4, we just do a calculation. Now, not much use. Uh, we could probably get around with, uh, get away with doing the algebra for, uh, for 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, but this scales up, uh, this very simple idea, scales up to uh, proving the four-color theorem. So, for example, to prove reducibility, we set up the problem, we uh, describe what, uh, assuming we have some configuration, uh, we describe mathematically what reducible means, so the fact that if you're uh, inside any other uh, map, you can rearrange colorings. Um, uh, we define some complicated function that checks whether uh, the configuration is reducible. We prove once and for all that this check is valid. So if the check pass, if the configuration passes the check, then it actually has to be mathematically reducible. And then if we have one specific reducibility test to do, so this is the test for configuration number 232 of the 633, uh, then, uh, so we have this complicated theorem uh, to prove where this kind of genetic code describe, uh, what, uh, describes what the configuration is. Uh, then we just need to apply this lemma. So that reduces the problem of checking mathematical reducibility to checking that a certain program returns true, and then you can just compute. And so this is a trivial proof, because it basically says, uh, prove, the, uh, prove this by applying this lemma, and then uh, basically using the axiom of, re of uh, reflexivity for equality. Uh, so it's a trivial proof, uh, but it does check 20 million cases, uh, and indeed the Cog computer uh, proof system actually takes uh, some time to uh, verify that uh, this lemma is, uh, is actually correctly proved. So uh, how can it be that we can write these programs that check mathematical properties? Well, uh, it's actually become a fine art in uh, uh, some uh, in part of computer science to design these uh, proof algorithms. And there are uh, sort of three big families of proof algorithms. There are the model checking algorithms, the combinatorial search algorithms, and uh, there's a technique for uh, checking program, specifically for checking programs that's called abstract interpretation. And all of these have industrial applications. So model checking is widely used uh, to design uh, computer circuits by all major uh, circuit uh, 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 industries. Uh, combinatorial search is used uh, by uh, major uh, software companies, including my own, uh, to uh, verify that software, that uh, basic software actually works properly. So the reason uh, why you're not getting as many blue screens of death 
in, uh, with modern version of Windows compared to the ones you had 10 years ago is because you have these uh, uh, combinatorial search program that check the uh, device drivers uh, that uh, other companies uh, plug into the system. And abstract interpretation is used quite widely by the aerospace industry. Uh, so every time you fly on an Airbus, uh, part of the reason the Airbus doesn't crash with you in it is because all the flight software has been checked by these algorithms. And curiously enough, all three families of algorithms turn out to be useful at some point in the proof of the four-color theorem. So basically, uh, the model checking is used in reducibility. The combinatorial search is used for proving unavoidability, the 10,000 map thing. And abstract interpretation is used to link, li to link the two together. So uh, in the uh, final part of the talk, I'll uh, uh, focus on the, uh, I'll keep the reducibility part and focus on the model checking. So how does one check reducibility? So let's uh, go a little deeper into this uh, business of fixing up a coloring to match a configuration. So suppose we have some kind of coloring. We can describe the coloring by putting four colors on the, um, inside the, uh, the regions. But uh, in 1880, Tate produced an alternative proof uh, of the four-color theorem, which was based on campus proof and then, and hence, just as wrong. But he had one nice idea, which was, uh, why bother about coloring the middle parts where we can color just the edges? And the way you, you change from the uh, regions to the edges is by using a little painting trick. So uh, assume you have your red, blue, and green markers, and they're sort of, uh, uh, well, they're a little wide, so they overlap at the borders. So where, they, where, they're, where the red and the yellow, yellow overlap, you get orange and so on. So now uh, all the uh, borders where you had two colors meeting have one of these three alternating colors. So what about the white? Well, I guess Tate couldn't have figured it out, but we, uh, everyone who has kids, uh, had kids uh, knows about magic markers. And so if the white is a magic marker that turns every color, uh, basic color in, into its opposite, so it turns uh, yellow to purple and blue to orange and so on, uh, then you can see that you'll also get one of these three colors around uh, each of the uh, white enclosures. And if we now erase the color in the enclosures, then we see that we get a coloring of the map where uh, at each intersection, we get one, uh, we get three edges that have three different colors. Mm -hmm. So we've switched from coloring uh, the middles to coloring the edges. Now, why is that important? Well, because uh, now we only have three colors to deal with instead of four. So we've sort of removed one variable. And we've also made it, uh, this operation that was apparently very complicated about modifying part of the outside map now becomes really simple. So if we look at what we want to do, if we take one of these uh, configuration and sort of erase uh, what's in the middle, and we uh, pull over a green screen so that you don't see the green edges so much now, probably not at all. Uh, well, you'll notice that uh, the uh, red and purple edges form uh, little loops that don't touch uh, and that hence don't affect uh, our configuration and otherwise cords that go from one point of the circle to the other, and these quartz can't cross each other. And now to recolor the map, what we can do is on any of these quartz, we can decide to exchange the two colors. So we can decide to exchange green and purple, say, on the bottom cord here. And now if we pull out the, uh, the green filter, we see that we still have a correct three coloring of the edges, and we can Chain, turn that into a coloring 
of the middles again, just by uh, picking one color for one region and then uh, computing the other colors uh, uh, one by one. So if we look closely at uh, how these chords are described, we can describe them uh, using a little language to uh, putting an open parens whenever we start a chord, a dot when we hit one of these green edges that doesn't count, and a closing paren uh, with a little parity indication to indicate when we meet the ending part of a chord that was open. And because the chords can't cross, the parentheses have to match each other. And so this way we describe the topography of the, uh, of the outside part of the map by this little word with uh, four symbols. And now we have the coloring, and we have a matching relation between, the, uh, between this chromogram, which describes the, uh, the topology, and the coloring. And the chromogram tells us exactly which colors can be flipped in the coloring. And so now we can play this, this reducibility game where we try to see whether a region is reusable. So the configuration tries to get at a coloring, and the context tries to foil it and uh, uh, prevent, uh, prevent the map from being colored. So um, we start the game by, at the configuration where, by erasing part of the internal borders and figuring out how the configuration might be colored. Right, because the coloring we're going to get by induction has to match the coloring with the, uh, of the mangled configuration. So it has to match one of these colorings. So that gives us a set of colorings which the context has to match. Now the context will match the colorings, but then it will return, uh, it has to match the coloring, but it has the choice of how it can connect the colors together. So it has the choice of getting a, a chromogram that matches one of these colorings. Now, the configuration will quite have patched things up by trying to flip chords or swap colors altogether. And uh, so that returns a new set, uh, a new coloring, and then the context can uh, try to get a new chromogram, and they can play this little game until the configuration says, oh, yeah, well, the... That uh, chromogram you gave me, it's actually a coloring I can match exactly. And we can turn this whole game into an algorithm. And so this is the flowchart of the algorithm, where we start, uh, we have at the start uh, three sets of colorings, uh, no, two sets of colorings and one set of chromograms. Uh, initially, uh, the two outer sets have all possible possibilities. The one in the middle have the colorings we're interested in, and we're going to compute things backwards. So we're going to first restrict the chromograms to um, uh, rule out those for which we uh, win instantly. And uh, if uh, we've... Uh, uh, if we still have uh, possible, um, uh, possible colorings, uh, then uh, we have to uh, take them out of the, uh, of the set of all colorings. So we get a new set of winning colorings. Uh, now we can swap colors and then loop back again. If at any point uh, we uh, have an empty set uh, either an empty set of impossible colorings or an empty set of uh, uh, of, uh, of chromograms, then, uh, well, we're uh, basically, uh, the context is out of moves, so we've won whatever we do. If uh, at any point uh, we've... Um, uh, if uh, we stop because uh, we have, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, run out of, uh, of winning uh, colorings, uh, then perhaps the, uh, perhaps the context 
has one, because if the context starts with a coloring in this uh, in the uh, set of remaining colorings, then there's no way we can match it. However, it might be the case that if we uh, uh, that none of these uh, uh, winning starting positions for the context are actually allowed, because perhaps none of them are allowed by the, uh, by the uh, are part of the colorings we get by erasing uh, the original edges, by the original contract. So in this case, if we actually match the contract, then uh, the, configuration is, uh, no, sorry, the configuration is said to be C-reducible. So that's the algorithm. And uh, it gets implemented pretty much that way, either in C or in, uh, or in COC. It's pretty much the same program. Uh, and it's, it's a very simple program because all it does is a little symbol pushing and a little more symbol pushing. And, um, uh, and this, uh, this kind of very concrete way of approaching mathematics is much better than the sort of early 20th century math based on pure symbols. Uh, basically, because uh, you can compute stuff. Uh, and you can use, uh, uh, instead of proving special properties for uh, each, uh, you can use uh, general data structures like lists and use properties of the list rather than reproving the same properties for each of your uh, uh, specific theories. So, for example, proving properties about lists of edges as being a, something very special rather than just using general theorems. Uh, so this is how uh, these concrete types get written in a um, in the uh, in the system I uh, I use. So we can write things. Uh, we can write uh, a type of list, for example, which is this uh, this one, the uh, function that merges two lists together. See, so it's pretty much the same thing as the definition of addition. Uh, I had up there, and you can even write concrete definitions for predicates, uh, so, which is useful because then the system can reason, uh, knows in, in, uh, instinctively how to reason with the properties you've described. So here's one of the uh, uh, little programs that help describe, uh, formalize the problem. So this is a program that's used to uh, describe how uh, a, one of these chromograms gets, uh, gets flipped, so how you flip one uh, parentheses, uh, one color in a, in a chromogram, and it's, so it's a very short program. And the nicer thing is, uh, is that not only is the program short, but the proof that this program is correct, so the proof that uh, this program, which is supposed to correspond to, um, to flipping, uh, flipping a color uh, actually does, uh, does this, so if it matches a uh, uh, one bit B, uh, so if the flip matches a bit B, then the original program has to match not B. Uh, well, the proof is just about as short as the program. Of course, it's not, uh, it's written uh, the same way the program is written in an algorithmic language, the proof is written in an algorithmic language, but that's what makes the, uh, the proof nice and short. Uh, and basically, that's why the uh, why this entire proof worked out uh, so well. So then, what now? So uh, my current so we had a number of project mentions, but not my own. So I can pitch uh, pitch it. So I'm uh, working on the group theory monster. So this is uh, uh, otherwise known as the classification of finite simple groups, and it's. Uh, widely regarded as one of the major achievements, uh, collective achievements of uh, 20th century math. Um, it's a 10,000 page proof, uh, and, uh, and there are actually some, uh, some programs in, uh, in the proof. Uh, I'm, uh, the four color theorem was a 30 page proof, uh, uh, and this one, uh, and it was doing very, very simple math. It was a sort of puzzle level. Uh, this is real, um, this is reach, real research level stuff. Um, I'm just tackling the odd case, uh, but we've actually made uh, pretty good progress uh, to it. Well, uh, sort of three quarters done. 
and and this is uh, whereas uh, the uh, proving the four color theorem showed that oh yes computers can do, can do something. Uh, the proving the fight Thompson theorem, the Euler theorem, will prove that computers can actually do uh, proofs can actually prove interesting things. Um, so uh, that's my current project, uh, and the uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting because it's classical math. So uh, mathematicians tend to regard uh, combinatorics and logic as kind of the po lowest possible form of life. Uh, so uh, and apparently analysis being the uh, the top of the uh, of the bucket. So algebra is kind of in the middle. Um, but I think you need to be able to do algebra to do any kind of serious analysis. So uh, I'm trying not to jump the gun here. And, um, and working on this has really pushed the envelope of uh, how to do these kinds of, uh, of proofs and understanding that really uh, uh, the organization of the material is the most important thing in uh, so the, uh, the major technical problems of theorem proving, uh, I believe I solved when I uh, worked on the four-color theorem. But the organization problems, I only ta really tackled with this work. So uh, I think I can wrap up now. Uh, we'll leave time for a few questions. Uh, so uh, proof assistants can do, uh, give real proofs of real theorems. Uh, it's uh, not only a matter of being really, really sure that the proof is correct, although there was still a bit of that in the four-color theorem, it's also a question of um, understanding why the proof works a lot better. Uh, because uh, once you've got the information inside the computer, you can process it with the computer every which way. Uh, when you do these proofs, uh, thinking about the times where you're really actually doing algorithms on paper and uh, sort of running them by hand uh, because, well, the math you were taught didn't include the description of algorithm and didn't include the use of a computer to run algorithms. Uh, it's, it's really important to think though, uh, to rethink those choices uh, once you actually move and have a machine at hand to really exp to exploit it. And proving programs uh, is very often easier than proving theorems. Uh, this reflection business of doing uh, computation, so it's useful for decision procedures, but the reason it actually uh, the uh, uh, the proof for this chromogram uh, twiddling program was so short was because uh, inside that proof, which is just a mathematical proof, uh, I was already using the uh, very computation of the uh, the very algorithm of the function to to prove a, to prove the uh, the function correct. So uh, using computation is not, not just for decision procedures, it's for all kinds of, uh, of proofs. And um, uh, especially things like combinatorics and mathematics uh, are best handled by algorithms rather than formal theories. Uh, and uh, so I've been now doing this for the past uh, seven or eight years, and it's really fun. And, uh, if you have the uh, opportunity, you should really try it. Yeah. Thank you Mm -hmm. Very interesting. But I wonder why your starting point was not just the case of graph coloring, and you don't have the topology and all to worry about either. Well, because it's uh, rather hard to specify convincingly that a graph is planar. You could use uh, you could use excluded minors, for example, 
uh, but it's it's not. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, you would actually have to go back from the excluded miner to uh, something like the Euler formula to be able to exploit it uh, for the rest of the proof. And second, it's not intuitively obvious that the uh, uh, minor exclusion actually characterizes planar graphs. Uh, and it was uh, actually, uh, so my initial work just focused on the combinatorial part. So I finished completely the combinatorial proof, starting from the hypermaps uh, uh, and uh, Euler formula. I had this external Jordan criterion, so I could move possibly from graphs with a Jordan property on them and perhaps uh, link this to, uh, to excluded minors. Um, but then it dawned on me that that was sort of wasted effort because it wouldn't convince uh, anyone, uh, anyone any better that I was really showing the four-color theorem. Um, and, and then I realized that if I went from the topology directly, I would short-circuit uh, entirely the Jordan uh, curve theorem that the, uh, there was a hidden cut in what most people were doing in saying, oh, well, intuitively we can do this uh, uh, dual graph thing, which we never explain exactly how we're doing it. And then, uh, oh, well, we have the wrong representation, so let's try to use the Jordan curve theorem to patch it. Uh, turns out if you, if you don't go to the uh, dual graph, in the first place. So what happens if you look at this discretization is that it, it's almost computing the dual graph, except uh, at the point where it crosses the border at a single point, it crosses the border at a square. And the fact that you keep the square means that you keep the actual topology. And it just makes everything simple. So if you, if, you keep, if, you, if you keep a single point at the crossing, then you lose uh, the uh, information of what's left, what's right, uh, basically the order of neighbors around any, uh, any given region. Uh, and then you have to work really, really hard at recovering it. Um, so by sort of not uh, and you can actually, and you can do it wrong. So you can, uh, the, uh, the actual precise specification of the, uh, of the four-color theorem sort of came out of, the, uh, of this exercise of trying to uh, derive the, the, the theorem from first, uh, go back to first principles. Uh, and I was surprised to see that uh, a year before uh, I published the result, uh, there's someone that, uh, some philosopher that actually published a paper explaining why the theory of four-color theorem was wrong, because if you actually stated it the, the wrong way with the wrong interpretation, uh, you would uh, indeed get ca counterexamples. Um, and someone sh uh, pointing him out, uh, that, and so he was apparently complaining uh, that I had claimed that I could prove the theorem completely formally, whereas he had proved that it was impossible. And someone pointed him at the uh, description of the, uh, of, of the underlying math that I, uh, and that, the, uh, that I actually had identified the issue and uh, used the, uh, the right definition. So the way you can get it wrong, um, if I can use board here. Uh, so the way you can get it wrong is to say, oh, well, what's a corner? So you can say, oh, well, the corner is when sort of two edges meet at a single point. So when you have a sort of isolated point of, uh, of contact. And uh, that's not a good, uh, and the, the reason you want to rule out corners, of course, is that uh, you can sort of build a pie chart with uh, any number of regions that touch at a corner. But if you take that, uh, that single point, blow it up, and then uh, twist it around uh, in a sort of logarithmic spiral shape, then you can have your uh, uh, borders that all spiral together to the same limit circle. And so now all of your regions are all touching on that limit circle. So you don't have a single point of contact. But it's nevertheless, all, uh, all points in the circles are just adjacent corners because they all touch 
uh, more than two regions. Uh, so, uh, so it's not really hard, but the, it's sort of what the, uh, these formal systems are good at identifying. They sort of keep you honest. Um, and, uh, and actually, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the correct definition of corner is rather simpler than the one that tries to uh, define what a, an isolated contact point is. Uh, well, fi uh, finite groups, is pr uh, as far as math is concerned, is pretty advanced. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm so uh, and, they, and my point was uh, in switching projects after the four-color theorem, um, I kind of got, got a blind ch uh, blank check from my employer to carry on this type of work once I've shown some, some measure of success. Uh, so I decided to spend my... Uh, uh, my credits on uh, this uh, on tackling something in group theory um, so, so it's, uh, for a for a variety of reasons, but this uh, but the group theory part is real uh, is real math and it, I, I'm not doubting that, but um, uh, there's, there's more there's more math outside of group theory, and which is wacky in ways which make can make it very hard to talk about. Uh, well, a lot of the math in group theory is very wacky. Okay. So I think the... Um, I'm Yeah, so it's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of apparently crazy overloading that apparently doesn't make any sense from the sort of early 20th century logician, uh, first order logician view of, uh, of things. And that actually makes sense if you think of them in a more modern uh, software engineering algorithmic way. And most of the work in, uh, in the, my recent past has been to figure out these things. Uh, and of course, they don't apply. Uh, the actual theorems proved don't, don't give you anything to do analysis, except of course, developing an entire uh, set of libraries for uh, basic algebra, linear algebra uh, uh, is going to be useful for any kind of analysis anyway. Uh, but I think the techniques for organizing the stuff, uh, those were really uh, rather hard to figure out, and I think those will carry over to, uh, to other domains. No, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. Um, it's um, no, not not fun uh, not fundamentally. Uh, it's just that the uh, and the uh, there is quite a, there's actually a, a bit of analysis in the four color theorem, and and that was the easy part. Uh, so uh, in some sense, the basic analysis and, and topology is rather easy to formalize. Uh, because it's actually hard to get right on paper. Uh, if you try, if you write your th random thing that appears to be obvious in topology, it's usually wrong because there's some twisted counterexample. Um, and, and so uh, when people write up uh, topology and analysis, they're often quite careful about how they, uh, they write things down, which makes it pretty easy to translate them to computers. Uh, whereas if you look at algebra, uh, you will see that uh, even a very formal text is, can be played pretty fast and loose. Um, okay, George, one uh, uh, 
byproduct of your work is, is that once you have a clock proof, you can generate programs out of it, the best of the button. Is, 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 that, is that correct? So, so from your proof, you can generate a coloring program. Is that right? Uh, it, uh, it, it is in principle. Mm -hmm. Um, though the, uh, you have to understand that the way this works in practice for, uh, in systems like Comsert, for example, which is a, a full C, uh, an industrial quality C compiler that's built inside Coq, proof correct inside Coq, and that actually runs, is that the programs you get out are the ones you wrote in Coq in the first place. So you don't get programs out, from mag uh, out by magic, you get the programs you, you write in. And the, uh, the proof was written to be as simple as possible. And the uh, way to make the proof as simple as possible is to write a silly, pro uh, a silly uh, coloring program, which obviously solves the problem, but the, uh, it just shows that the problem is solvable. And then you show that uh, the program always succeeds. Um, uh, which means that the program you get out is the silly program you put in, which is not going to be wonderfully efficient. Uh, so in principle, if you, if you did things right, you can get out of this theorem a program that has, I think, n squared uh, complexity. That is n squared with a constant of one billion. <laughs> 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 yes. <it's laughs> okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank again uh, George. And